Welcome and good morning, everybody. My name is Marit Schnepp from the Europark Federation, and I'm facilitating today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is uh, organized by the Nature Regional Landscape Task Force of Europark, and the topic is climate change. Climate change is obviously a major threat to life on Earth, and a lot is happening already in terms of mitigation and adaptation measures on the ground. And the nature regional landscape parks across Europe are actually a very good example for that. Um, so in today's webinar, we look into um, concrete examples from the ground. And also one of the main activities from the task force this year was the creation of the Declaration on Climate Change. This one was signed and launched during the Europa conference this year. And now with this uh, webinar, we are launching the declaration publicly, aiming to not only raise awareness on the topic, but also to already show successful measures that are being implemented by the nature parks and to join forces with other parks across Europe. So in this webinar, we will introduce the declaration and dive deeper into case studies on climate change adaptation on the ground. So yeah, grab a cup of top coffee or some tea and enjoy the webinar. Mm. So before we start, just some basic rules. Um, as you have noticed by entering the room, the webinar is being recorded so that we can share um, it afterwards with our members and participants. Um, feel free to turn off your camera, but also feel free to open it up so we can actually some, see some faces. If you have any questions to the speakers, just uh, put your question, comments, or links into the chat, and we will get back to them um, as time allows. And yeah, as I said, um, the webinar is being recorded and the presentations will be made available after the webinar. So before we start uh, officially, just for those who don't know Europark, we are the biggest and oldest network for protected and conserved areas in Europe. And this year we actually celebrated 50 years, which is quite a big achievement. We have more than 400 members, including protected areas, national government organizations, NGOs, or administrative bodies. Um, what do we do? We facilitate networking in a nutshell, organize events, conferences, seminars, workshop, we offer trainings, and we work in so-called commissions and task forces on dedicated topics. That, for example, includes the Nature Regional Landscape Task Force that was um, established last year and is now working specifically on that climate change topic. We also do a lot of policy work um, to create the link between the parks um, and the European level. Um, yeah, and if you want to learn more, um, just check out our website or follow us on social media. So as I said, today's webinar is organized by the Task Force uh, Nature Regional Landscapes Parks. And yeah, since this is our very first webinar, we will have a short introduction to the Nature Regional Landscape Parks by Christian Pjornstedt. He's the director of Norske Park in Norway and also the lead of the task force at Europark. Um, afterwards, Nina Zitz, project manager for the Association of Austrian Nature Parks. Um, she was leading the development of the climate declaration and she will introduce it shortly, its purpose, what it's meant to achieve and the next steps. Afterwards, we will dive deeper into the concrete examples. First, we have Eliot Lorima from the Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty in England, who will share their experience on habitat conservation efforts on conser conserving and restoring different habitat types in the framework of their climate change adaptation plan. Second, we have Matthias Görres from the Association of German Nature Parks, and he will introduce their adaptation approaches across the touristic and agricultural sectors in Germany. And lastly, um, Simone Zanter and Fabian Heinzius from the Naturpark Ur in Luxembourg will introduce the Climate Pact and how its implementation in the member municipalities are working out. 
So I'm very, I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot and hopefully get inspired by these examples. So without further delay, I'm handing over to Christian for the introduction on the nature regional landscape parks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marit, and, and thank you, Europark, for organizing this uh, webinar together with us. Uh, and um, thank you all for your interest in uh, the, the important topic of uh, today and also the nature regional landscape uh, parks. And also a special thanks to Nina Sitz and the Austrian nature parks for taking the lead in the climate change adaptation work. We are really grateful for that. So we in the, uh, the uh, Nature Regional Landscape Parks Task Force, we are excited to show you the results of our work on uh, climate change adaption this year. And also to show you, uh, as Marit said, some, uh, some practical cases from our parks. Um, so we are the living landscapes of Europe, uh, but we are also the lived in landscapes of Europe. So it is here that climate action is urgent. And that is why we call on European decision makers to support the work on parks and protected areas and our nature regional landscape parks. Because we think we are the best partners for this type of work. We are actually located all across Europe. We are now uh, more than 900. Uh, parks. We are close to a thousand parks and we make up almost 8% of the European Union, uh, UK, Norway and Switzerland. So we're quite uh, quite a lot and I'm sure many of you who are joining us today are actually sitting in one of our NRL parks. Uh, we um, we uh, differ in names uh, and uh, but we also share common principles in terms of the mission and governance. And I'll get back to that uh, in a while. And uh, while we congratulate uh, Europark with 50 years today, we should also note that the German nature parks are 60 years today. And that uh, Europark is the federation of who was established uh, with a leading role of, of the German nature parks. And we actually, we grew out of a very war-torn Europe after the Second World War. Um, and we have taken on important new roles as we have grown older. Um, and we are now in our uh, prime years and we are taking on uh, climate change uh, adaptation. Uh, we are... Um, Often sparsely populated rural, rural areas, uh, but with very high natural cultural heritage. Um, and we are recognized for that. But we are also very people oriented. So we involve local authorities, communities and partners. Um, and our objective is often to find a balance between human activities and the preservation of resources. And that can also uh, sometimes be uh, a bit difficult, as, uh, as you all know, but uh, we think that our uh, cooperation model and our action uh, is actually something uh, worth uh, supporting. So we work on conservation, preservation, enhancement of landscapes. We also work on development, sustainable tourism development, recreation. Uh, we work with uh, with uh, agricultural sectors, as we will hear from from Germany. Uh, so the sustainable development of rural areas is is very very important, um, uh, and and um, and environmental education, of course. So junior rangers, youth work, the nature park schools. This is also very important in our work on on climate change. We um, we think that our uh, type of uh, our category of parks is, is actually a, a great uh, uh, cooperation model for action on climate change adaption. As you will see, we are we are a holistic, we take a holistic approach to our our landscapes and, and nature. And I think that's very valuable because much of our problems today with ch climate change, it comes from the separation of people and nature, right? So we do need sort of holistic integration actors 
across Europe that can see this in, in an integrated way. And that's why I think the NRL parks have a, a real mission. We um, are a task force and uh, we, uh, we are a very active group have been for the last year. We, uh, we have lots of fun and uh, we have a great discussions. Uh, we make up uh, a, a working group uh, with uh, representatives of the national and federal networks of, of nature regional parks across Europe. Um, uh, and, and now Germany, Austria, France, Belgium, England, Switzerland, Luxembourg, are um, uh, and Norway, of course, I represent Norway. We are, uh, we are working together in our uh, task force. Task force. Um, but if you uh, are working at a national or federal level with this category of parks, we would very much like to uh, get in touch with you. So, uh, so get get in touch through Europe Park, and uh, you can join our uh, our work. And we have lots of other plans uh, in in the years ahead. Um, you can uh, learn more about our uh, our work. Uh, we have several good publications now on on the NRL parks, and also um, if you're more curious about how we work, how we are made up, uh, and uh, in our structures and and our tasks, then then just click on the links in in the Europe Park uh, Federation uh, website, um, and look into this these uh, resources here. So uh, with that, I uh, would like to uh, just uh, wish you all an interesting webinar and um, and, uh, and ask Nina to take the lead afterwards. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Yeah, indeed, a very enthusiastic task force we have here with lots of um, ideas and activities planned. And yeah, I'm handing over to Nina. Just one second to share my screen. Okay. Nina, please. Thank you, Marit. So as Marit already said, and as many of you might have already known, um, during the Europa conference in Leoran this year, the task force of the Nature Regional Landscape Parks has launched and signed off our declaration on climate change. So for this paper, the associations and federations of the nature regional landscape parks of several countries, Christian already named them, <laughs> came together to tackle the major threats, climate change, biodiversity loss, and habitat degradation. Marit, would you switch, please? Thank you. So um, for us, these global challenges, they're interconnected. Climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies, they call for healthy and well-connected ecosystems. Due to the interrelation of climate change and biodiversity loss, we as a task force see it as necessary to address these two topics together. And as these are global issues, they require joint action. So Christian already said the NRL parks are essential for the conservation of biodiversity and landscapes. And well, we lead the way in addressing climate change. And the parks are doing so by delivering nature-based solutions. With a more integrated approach, this category of parks can contribute greatly to solving problems that are climate, climate <laughs> related in our living landscapes. So to illustrate this point, let me give you some examples on what the NRL parks do. We will hear some more later, but just um, quickly. So there is peatland restoration, um, sustainable mobility initiatives, the reduction of light pollution, and even across the agricultural sector, there is climate adaptation. They implement holistic land use management practices. The parks also implement and promote low emission actions. They support the improvement of the local food sector to create um, short supply chains. That's just to name a few. 
mag ich dir bitte soon. <laughs> um, so, as I said, you will be introduced to several um, other case studies later on. You can already see through these projects, NRL parks are already creating a more climate resilient land management. And as NRL parks build on many strengths to implement climate measures, um, they're including their competence in sustainable regional development, and they're also very strongly anchored within the regions and the communities. Okay, Mar Margit, now it's your turn again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so now it's our vision that the nature regional landscape parks are distinguishing themselves throughout Europe as showcase regions for linking climate measures and biodiversity protection. And that's why the task force of the NRL parks developed the Declaration on Climate Change. Margit, please. Thank you. So with this declaration, we attempt to increase the visibility of the valuable work that the NRL parks do in the field of climate protection. Well, because NRL parks, they play a vital role in implementing European policies. We have, for example, the nature restoration law, the habitat and birds directive, the water framework directive, the biodiversity strategies, and even the green infrastructure strategy where we tap into. And for that, the NRL parks are often presented as model regions for the innovative and also sustainable development of rural areas. And they're often seen as partners for sustainable agriculture and tourism. And especially in these areas, they focus on adopting regenerative approaches. Another very important pillar in our work, as Christian already mentioned, is education. So through the educational and communication programs of the parks, they raise the awareness of the public and we can even say they inspire sustainable choices and practices within communities. And one of our key target group is the youth. So whether it's the school kids in nature park schools or junior rangers or the involvement of young committed climate aware people in nature conservation. Marit. So as you can see, um, the work of the NRL parks is a crucial component in ensuring, well, a viable climate adaptation and mitigation response. With our declaration on climate change, we shine a light on this work. And at the same time, we call upon policymakers at all levels to invest in and work with the parks across Europe. We all know each protected area needs adequate resourcing to tackle these challenges and the support of the governing authorities. So we are not only asking for their support in the before mentioned um, points and areas that I yeah, just, just um, told you about, but um, we see it as beneficial to involve the NRL parks on the European and even the regional level in climate action planning. So this would help to improve climate change adaptation measures, um, to conduct spatial planning that is climate sensitive and to implement future oriented management strategies. Another one of our claims in this declaration is to integrate the strategic orientation of parks and protected areas in funding programs and also to include parks and protected areas as target groups in funding calls. Well, so far, so good. So this is just some information on the content and on um, the goals of our declaration. So Marit, let's look at the next steps. So until now, um, Many national associations and federations of the European Nature Regional Landscape Parks, they have joined us and signed the declaration. And as a side note, Margaret already um, mentioned it, we're still collecting signatures. So in case 
you're interested, don't hesitate to contact me or Europark. We'll get in touch anyways. So with this declaration, the task force and, well, of course, the individual associations and federations, they can approach policymakers at the European, national, and even regional level to illustrate our contribution to climate adaptation and mitigation, and then, of course, our future potential. It's really a powerful signal that the nature regional landscape parks across Europe unite with this common goal. And we are, after all, a vibrant network of protected areas and we have a voice. Well, Christian already said we cover about 8% of the total surface area of the EU, including Switzerland, the UK and Norway. And that's that's something. Yeah, and next year for the European elections, we are also planning on presenting our declaration. And we also find that the European Day of Parks is a suitable date to shine a light onto the NRL parks and for lobbying. Good, Marit. Thank you, I'll hand the word back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nina. And I think you should have see a link in the chat already with the link to the declaration and an article. So better not now, but later you can have a look and uh, yeah, check it out. So with that, um, we will go into the case studies and actually see what they really do on the ground. Um, and our first case study will be presented by Elliot. Um, so I'm handing over to him and yeah, his example from the areas of outstanding natural beauty in the England. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. I'll just try and get the slideshow to appear. Is that okay? Great. So this morning, um, I just want to take you through an example of where we've worked uh, to develop a climate change adaptation plan within the Forest of Oland and how we've then used that adaptation plan uh, to guide our habitat restoration uh, work over the last decade. Um, so I'll start off with an introduction to the area, then tell you a little bit more about the climate change adaptation plan, and then uh, a little bit of detail on the uh, habitat restoration work, a couple of the areas that we've been working on. I haven't timed it, so I hope uh, I'm not going to go over. I might go under. No one's ever complained if you finish early. I don't think so. We should be okay. So uh, I will start on the first slide. A few key facts about the Forest of Poland. Um, well, first of all, it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, that designation may not be familiar to everybody. It's um, along, It sits alongside the, the national parks in England and is uh, one uh, a protected landscape uh, category, IUCN category five. Uh, so that gives everyone a, 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 an idea. So the area itself is internationally important for its blanket bog, uh, heather moorland, upland hay meadows, and rare birds, for example, the hen harrier, as you can see here, or as I learned in the Netherlands, it was called Kikendief, I think. Have I got that right? Hopefully someone from the Netherlands can tell me if I've got it right or wrong. Um, the area is located in the northwest of England um, and covers 802 square kilometers. It's important to say, I didn't actually put this on the on the slide, that um, almost all of the land uh, in the Forest of Boland is privately owned. Um, so we have to work careful, uh, closely with landowners and farmers across the area to help us uh, implement some of the projects that we want to. Um, the highest point of the area is 561 meters. So uh, we call them the fells, the Boland fells. Uh, they're not mountains quite, but, you know, they're uh, an upland area. Um, over 20% of the area is designated uh, for conservation as um, sites, special, uh, sites, special protection areas and uh, special areas of conservation. And another 14% is uh, designated as local wildlife sites um, at a county or local authority level. It's relatively sparsely populated with uh, around 16,000 people living across the area. 
but we we are close to large urban areas as uh, it says there over a million people live within 30 minutes of the um the AOMB so I did need I always feel like I need to give a, a short explanation of uh if you're a forest then where are all the trees um so it's actually uh, it's a historic term so that and going back to the the origins of the words uh, the word forest then uh, it comes from foristus silva and silva meaning woodland and foristus meaning outdoor um and commonly the forest uh, historic forests in england were extensive areas of rough land and it was a mosaic of different habitats that you can see listed there the land itself was then uh, either owned by the king or the, the hunting rights were given to a major landowner um, and it was kept for uh, deer, hunting deer. So the forest of Boland is, is closer to this historic meaning. And you can see in the picture here, a sort of patchwork of uh, agricultural land, woodland going up onto open uh, fells and moorland. So the, it's much closer to the, the types of forest that you might be more familiar with in other parts of Europe. Uh, and even this sort of plantation forest that we have more commonly in uh, in England. So moving on to uh, the work that we did uh, in terms of a climate change adaptation plan, this is quite some time ago, you'll see 2011, um, the Natural England who are the, nature con the National Nature Conservation uh, Agency in England, they uh, supported the Forest of Poland uh, to develop a climate change adaptation plan. So it was one of the first areas in England to take forward that work. Um, so the plan itself is designed as a plan for taking actions which um, reduce the vulnerability of habitats, species, in this case, ecosystem services described, but we also, we call all of these collectively, and I will do further on assets. Uh, please bear with me on that terminology. Um, and to make these less vulnerable, uh, to reduce the vulnerability to the impacts of climate change. So the first assessment in uh, 2011 used the uh, UK climate projections um, from 2000, I think it was gathered in 2008 and then published in 2009. Um, to give you a bit of a, a flavor of what that those projections say, um, that we in Forest Poland can expect much hotter and drier summers with temperature increases between two and 5.9% uh, 5.9 uh, degrees Celsius, which I really hope we never get close to 5.9. Um, and also a significantly or significantly less uh, precipitation rain uh, in, uh, in the area, but also um, uh, sort of uh, corresponding to that, that warmer, wetter winters with temperature increases and, mu and, a, and much more rain. More recently, we've looked back at or looked at the more recent, sorry, the uh, climate change projections, and that suggested similar again, hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, but also an added uh, uh, factor, which is increased frequency and intensity of extreme events, whether that's flooding dry drought spells, um, which obviously have significant impact for agriculture. Um, and these are some of the things we've already been noticing. Extended dry warm weather in spring. Um, some, and I didn't add it here in the, in the uh, bullet points, but some very increasingly um, very uh, short spells where we get extremely high temperatures that we've never seen before. Uh, two years, two summers ago, we had uh, 37 degrees in a part of Lancashire close to the Forest of Poland, which is way above what it's ever been before. So, yeah, increasingly concerning. But um, also increases intensity of summer rainfall, how that and then extends into early autumn. And the consequence of that is more frequent river and surface water flooding. We're also seeing the increased frequency of storm events with high winds. Sometimes these are close, you know, in quick succession, one after another, in particularly in the autumn period. And on occasion, coming from unusual wind direction, you might wonder why that's significant. But if you've got, obviously, you've got prevailing wind, then uh, the, particularly in terms of woodland, the, the trees are have grown in a way that um, protects themselves from the prevailing wind. So if you then get it from another direction, suddenly, 
you've got uh, areas of woodland and forestry that are flattened. So the, going through a process of identifying the key assets and then looking at the, the vulnerabilities of those, we identified a series of uh, key habitats within the area. You can see listed here the ones I'm going to talk about in more detail about blanket bog and upland hay meadows. Um, but we also had things like uh, rush pastures, which are like rough, rough pastures that are used with particularly um, for agriculture, um, for uh, beef and sheep grazing, uh, sorry, ca cattle and uh, sheep grazing. And uh, those are areas that we, we continue to work with farmers through other schemes, but I won't talk about in too much detail today. There are other habitats that were mentioned that were, were identified as more vulnerable and where we could take action, which included wet woodland um, and looking at how we can help uh, protect the, sort of, uh, the hydrology of sites of those woodlands and also look at how you can protect against uh, the, the impacts of nutrients on farmland close to those. And the same goes for springs, flushes, uh, ponds and rivers. One that's not a habitat that we did identify as particularly vulnerable and obviously is very relevant to protected areas when you're trying to uh, invite people to come and enjoy the area where the vulnerability of the footpaths and bridleways, particularly with the extreme or more common extreme rain events and things like that, those are having a big impact on those uh, trails. So there is an impact there and we have to look at how we increasingly, how we manage and maintain those. Um, and then lastly, uh, a very specific thing that we have in our area about wood parkland landscapes, uh, which are sort of open landscapes, designed landscapes, uh, which are, are uh, increasingly um, at risk of things like uh, pests and diseases coming into the, uh, coming from other uh, areas that are unfamiliar to the, the ecosystems here. So that's um, just a very, brief outline of where we identified the through the adaptation plan um so what were the actions that were proposed they were they were nothing new really and in the sense it was about bringing those as i've described here assets so the, the habitats whether it's the um the the trails that i mentioned earlier into a good condition so that they can be more resilient to the climate change that we expect to see or that we're already seeing um but they also proposed that we try to uh, work at a much, a greater scale, a landscape scale, as it says on the slide there. And um, also actions that make space for nature. So that, uh, that, that allow um, perhaps natural processes to, to, um, to take place where at the moment, perhaps they're more carefully managed by, by humans. Um, so this plan has then helped us to prioritize our uh, habitat restoration work since it was published in 2011. And uh, ourselves as a team in the, in the AOMB, we focused on peatland restoration and on upland hay meadow restoration, two um, types of habitats. I mean, the, the peatland encompasses both heather moorland and the blanket bog habitats. Um, and that, those are very characteristic of, this, of our landscape. So again, we felt they were particularly important for us to to help restore so just a little bit on peatland restoration uh what does that actually what does that what, what do we do when we are involved in in looking at a, a peatland restoration project the the picture that you can see there which looks like lots of squiggly lines and dots on maps is actually to uh show where we have identified in particular if you can see the green lines, that's where what we describe as bare peat. Um, so it's um, where there's soils that are exposed to the uh, air. There's no vegetation. And so there's very uh, significant loss of peat when it rains. And then also when it dries in the summer, then it, it actually can just um, blow away and and uh, it's gone for <laughs> in, into, into the atmosphere, into uh, into rivers. So one of the things that we look to try to do is revegetate that bare peat. And there's lots of different techniques for that, but 
prim primarily it's trying to get uh, the vegetation back. So there may be, um, we can put down a, what's called a geotextile to protect it and create a micro habitat uh, to allow the vegetation to, to take hold. Um, in some cases, we don't need to use that. And it's just a simple um, reseeding of that area, a relatively simple reseeding of that area. And what's really important there is there's a very quick uh, uh, instant, almost instantaneous, <laughs> once you've got that vegetation there, the reduction is, is significant in terms of the carbon loss. Um, then the other parts of it where you've got the dots, that shows where we are uh, looking at um, putting in different types of dams, whether that's using the existing peat, using stone or using timber to uh, create little dams, whether that's in man-made um, ditches that have been dug um, previously to try to make the land more productive for, for um, farming um, or natural gullies and things that have been created. So that's where we, we look at putting these dams in to slow the flow of water. And there's a benefit there, not just for carbon. Um, it helps to restore the, the hydrology and also the, the, ha the, the habitat itself is in better condition, but also you have the potential there for it to help to reduce the impacts of flooding downstream. Um, so there are multiple benefits that come from this. And also if you've a wetter site, a wetter site, then there's also perhaps lower risk in terms of, uh, re you know, reducing uh, the intensity severity of wildfires if those are ever to uh, occur in the area and then it's important to say so obviously this is about getting the habitat into good condition to help uh, protect it and also make it more resilient to the impacts of climate change so that's the adaptation side but if you can get this habitat into good condition then essentially it, a healthy functioning peatland or blanket bog actually sequesters carbon for the atmosphere. So there is a specific type of vegetation, which is sphagnum moss, which is very uh, effective at uh, absorbing carbon, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. So there's so many, mul there's multiple wins in doing this work. So it makes it a very important part of, of what we're trying to do, both in terms of adapting to the climate change that we expect, but also trying to actually tackle it. So as a partnership, we've managed projects uh, over the last decade, helping to restore over uh, almost 2,000 hectares of peatland. So quite a significant area. And that's only where we're actually doing the work. The, 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 the effects of the work actually extend much beyond that, that 2,000 hectares. So it's quite significant areas. And more recently, we've been able to secure uh, several million pounds of funding from the UK government from a, a program or a scheme called the Nature for Climate Peatland Grant Scheme. Uh, so that's something we're working on currently, and there are sites actually undergoing restoration as I speak. Um, some of the things that you'd or that you, if you came to see when it was happening, uh, we have to because these areas are relatively remote. We have to use helicopters to uh, fly in uh, the the materials to to do the work. Um, and also then you can see where there's timber dams, which are actually starting to hold the water. And then on the lower picture, you have the peat created dams. Um, it's probably too small for you to be able to see that, but that work there was carried out in last winter. Um, and that's a photograph of the pools forming and some of the vegetation already growing on the, the bare peat, which was extending up above where the pools are um, in uh, September this year. So it's very quick. You can see some very quick uh, effects of doing this work. So it's, it's obviously there's some way to go for it to get to a point where it's a, a healthy functioning blanket bog again, but it goes some way to, towards that work very quickly. And then perhaps slightly, slightly more briefly, uh, I just wanted to uh, explain some of the work we've done on upland hay meadow restoration. So as you can see, a very beautiful meadow uh, on, the, on the right of the screen there, uh, which there aren't all that many of these left, unfortunately, within the forests of Boland and also uh, nationally right across the country in terms of uh, in England. 
I think it's between about 97 and 98 percent of upland hay meadows have been lost since the 1940s. So we have a tiny fraction left. So any increase in uh, the sort of areas that are either upland hay meadows or perhaps species rich grassland, if it doesn't get to the, if it's not in a, in a particularly, uh, in an upland area, but still within forest of Poland, um, any increase is, is vital. So 300 hectares may not sound like a huge area, but it is in the context of this, uh, this habitat. So the reasons for those losses are, are primarily to do with the uh, changes in agricultural practices. Um, but we are seeing through a farming program that we have right now, a, a, a return, an increased interest in returning to perhaps more traditional, less intensive, uh, in some places, less intensive uh, agricultural practices, which helps to, and, in, and also an interest from farmers in uh, maintaining at least one or two meadows on their farm. Often they'll say things like, uh, well, that field has always been a meadow and my grandfather has kept it or my grandmother has kept it as a meadow and I want to keep it that way. So there are there's some cultural and historical uh, attachments to these to these habitats. So in the, in the main, what this work involves is, and I've said on the slide there, it's working at both a farm and community scale, but what it usually uh, entails is preparing an area of ground for, uh, for uh, to receive either um, seed that is collected from an existing hay meadow, or in some cases, green hay, as it's described, which is cut and collected and moved to the site within a matter of hours and has to be, otherwise it won't be effective. So there's a lot of work to do to pair up the uh, the different uh, to match up all the do the donor sites with the where the 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 uh, the, the um, green hay or seed is going to be spread. So there's a there's a bit of work that we get involved in in facilitating that and working between all the different landowners to to manage that. So I suppose there's obviously the adaptation aspect of the the climate change. Uh, uh, in terms of it addressing climate change adaptation, but also there are some benefits there in terms of deeper rooting wildflower species also help to store more soil carbon than, than ryegrasses, which are used primarily in um, more intensive grasslands um, agricultural systems. So there is, a, there is, there is some uh, mitigation there in terms of the, the activities here as well. So I think that was most of what I was going to say, um, other than just to finish by saying that we're, we are doing a refresh, you would have noticed that it was 2011 when we did that climate change adaptation plan, which is quite some time ago. But we are now currently doing a refresh of that adaptation plan. And particularly, we want to use that plan to help inform, again, to help inform what we're describing as a nature recovery plan, but others may in other parts of Europe described as a nature restoration plan. But and also to it would be a wider, um, a part of a wider climate action plan with, which would look at how we manage the des uh, play the area as a destination for visitors and trying to encourage people to use public transport or active travel, which is you know cycling uh, and walking um, to reduce their um, reliance on, on private cars. And then more generally, we have a, a management plan which covers the whole area. And again, obviously, that will feed into the that management plan as we begin a review of that very soon. So thank you very much. Uh, that's a very relatively brief trot through uh, that topic. I'm happy to receive any questions if anyone has any. Um, yeah. And I'll, stop, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Elliot. Yeah, you, I actually had one question that you just answered um, in your last sentences about the chain adaptation of the adaptation plan to, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, um, how do you say? Yeah, to refresh it basically yeah. on new findings. We do have a question in the chat from Heidi. She's asking, after you have identified vulnerabilities, did you use a specific, perhaps theoretical model for the adaptation plan, like resist, adapt, direct, for example? Uh, I think there was, 
we d we didn't use any particular scenarios of what might happen to to uh, it was more just to identify where the most vulnerable habitats were. Uh, there was a scale, so it, I didn't show that in there. There were some that were highest priority in terms of their their the the most vulnerable, down to ones that are slightly less vulnerable or ones that we felt we didn't really need to take any action with. So there was a, a prioritization there. Some of the other habitats where we, we haven't focused our attention, there are other organizations within our area. So we are a small team with a relatively small team within our uh, protected area. There are other organizations who are perhaps out there to help on uh, river protection and uh, the, the impacts there. Uh, similarly, in terms of woodland creation, uh, which is obviously another way to, to um, adapt to climate change and also to, to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So there's, there's, there are other organizations. So there was a prioritization there, but I don't think there was any specific model. Okay, thank you. Well, that's also interesting. And yeah, if you have Anna, any other questions, just put them in the chat and we can also answer them in writing and move on to the next speaker. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Elliot. That was very interesting. And yeah, now we are hearing from Matthias Goris. He is the coordinator of ecosystem restoration, natural climate mitigation projects in the parks in Germany, nature parks in Germany. And with that, I'm handing over to Matthias. Thank you very much for being here. And yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think you are seeing the, the version where you also see my comments, right? Yeah, we see the presentation mode. Okay. So, will be fine now? Yes, perfect. Great. Hello and good morning also from Germany. Um, we're located in Bonn, the uh, Association of German Nature Parks. Um, I'll be speaking um, today about how we um, work on climate change adaptation across sectors, especially on tourism and agriculture sectors in the NRL Parks Network in Germany. So um, generally, of course, it depends a lot on the, the setting and what's going on. Um, also on a political level here in Germany, you might have heard that uh, yeah things are a bit complicated at the moment because of the financial budget of the country and how uh, money can you can be distributed. But generally, we're rather lucky this year or currently that there is a huge budget for ecosystem restoration um, being applied in this and the upcoming years um, to be able to restore a lot of uh, natural areas uh, regarding climate change and biodiversity. Um, yeah, after a quick introduction, now we will look into the integration in natural regional landscape parks here in Germany, and then I'll present uh, uh, case studies. Um, so maybe going back a bit to the global level, um, of course, we're looking into global warming and uh, biodiversity loss, which, uh, yeah, changes a lot uh, of the situation and uh, circumstances in, in our parks. Uh, looking at the planetary boundaries, what does it mean exactly? So in climate change regards, we're looking into uh, higher CO2 concentrations and stronger radiative forcing than, uh, yeah, than working for a safe operating space. Uh, in the biosphere integrity, we're looking into a huge loss of genetic diversity and functional integrity. <clears throat> the land system change is also a major issue, um, as well as the biogeochemical flows. Um, not looking into novel entities today. Um, that means, uh, yeah, despite all the, the talks about in the past years about uh, ongoing crisis, um, we see that climate change and biodiversity um, loss and collapse are major issues that can even overcome the financial burdens and challenges that we uh, undergo or underwent through um, the pandemic and uh, yeah the the current political situation. Um, looking into more detail of the planetary boundaries um, regarding the SDGs and the life cycle analysis of 
different sectors, um, which aspects do we have to consider? So this means uh, regarding human well-being aspect, um, of course, um, the biodiversity um, and climate change um, situation. Um, novel entities also are here mentioned as an important aspect. Um, regarding the, the different uh, biospheres, so the freshwater, marine, and um, terrestrial biodiversity, um, there's, of course, major issues regarding eutrophication, uh, land use change, um, acidification, um, the use um, of water um, and ecotoxicity. Ecotoxi um, yeah. Um, on a local level, um, going into our parks network, which uh, comprises of uh, one in four um, parks, uh, so 28% of land surface, as you saw earlier on the European map, that's a rather, a rather large um, amount or percentage of the German um, terrestrial area. Um, we have 18 of 82 million inhabitants in Germany living in the um, NRL parks. Um, mostly, mostly there, the NRL parks are legally registered in associations um, or connected with municipalities and a provincial level. And their main responsibilities are nature conservation, tourism, education, and regional development. That's also why we look at these sectors today. Um, yeah, nature-based solutions or ecosystem restoration as such, uh, of course, it presents um, a great opportunity to um, strengthen sustainable, strengthen human well-being and biodiversity, and also um, promote sustainable development, um, offering a lot of services that are otherwise compromised by the degrading ecosystems. Here you can have a quick look um, into the 21 model regions, pilot regions that we um, just recently decided on, upon for um, the appraisal of restoration potential in our um, NRL parks. So there will be a lot of, um, yeah, with the, with the current action program on um, natural climate mitigation, um, we are we are aiming for, um, yeah, working with those parks, especially to um, yeah get some get some funding um, for forests, um, mire, um, floodplain restoration measures, uh, also in the agricultural so ag agroforestry area. Um, as you can see uh, on the bottom left, so the southwest of Germany, um, the black forest regions are part of this, uh, which we will have a closer look at later on. Um, looking into the tourism sector, so um, of course, the value chain of tourism um, has a lot of potential to decrease emissions. And that was our initial take um, to look at um, Katzensprung means uh, a cat's leap. So just a short hop, the next attractive touristic destination is just a short hop away from where people live. So um, close to a lot of the um, municipalities and larger, larger regions. Um, with a lot of urban density in Germany. Um, there's usually a natural um, an NR park around. Um, so that's what we what we targeted already in the first phase uh, from 17 to 20. And in the current phase, we work with uh, 19 pilot parks that um, yeah, work with a strong partner network um, on their touristic services. Um, and together with those um, we're trying to decrease with a with a huge list of measures um, their greenhouse gas emissions um, and catalyze investments in climate change adaptation. So that means, of course, in many cases, um, looking into accommodations, looking into small businesses that support these um, touristic value chains in the regions, um, but also raising attractiveness and popularity of local touristic destinations, rather than people going abroad, taking an airplane to the next um, yeah, sunny destination or to the next natural area. And uh, for example, from, from our perspective in the Mediterranean, for example, uh, where a lot of Germans go for holidays, 
or vacations, um, rather keeping those people here and um, yeah, with a um, with a set of measures for climate protection adaptation and biodiversity conservation. Um, yeah, just maybe to mention also on the second part of this um, project, we also work with um, strong research and scientific partners. Bogota Institute, uh, Technical University in Berlin, and also the um, Applied um, University of Applied Sciences in Münster. Um, looking at the regional networks that I already mentioned, of course, um, surrounding those or in integrated in those uh, NRL parks, um, we look at uh, enablers um, um, that that can actually yeah work towards um, the stronger adaptation um, uh, of the of the area. Um, as the touristic value chain is cross-sectoral with benefits for local people and economies, um, we look here at <clears throat> cultural services, um, mobility services, for example, um, <clears throat> services of physical, physical exercise or sports, for example, um, nutrition, um, and um, of course, the facilities that we uh, supply as NRL parks. Uh, it always depends on this challenge of the last mile. So to um, uh, use those short distances to support the sustainable access, access, accessibility of regional services, um, basically to overcome people using their own uh, cars um, and rather rather than that, taking um, public transport, for example. Um, so the regional character um, decreases emissions and uh, fosters climate protection. Looking at the greenhouse gas budgets or the emissions that could be reduced, for example, in this project year, we're able to reduce um, the CO2 equivalent by 144,000 tons. Um, a lot of this uh, depends on the people that we've reached through our um, communication campaigns and that we work with in the respective areas. Um, on the right, you have a, an estimate of how much those um, journeys might, might uh, entail regarding emissions. So, for example, traveling with the airplane to, uh, um, yeah, a, a touristic spot, for example, in the Mediterranean could entail 6,000 kilograms of CO2 emissions, um, all inclusive, or sorry, that was the long-term, uh, long-distance uh, flights um, in the Mediterranean. This would uh, mean uh, 1,000 kilograms of CO2. And uh, traveling in Germany, for example, um, they would have this, um, this amount, uh, so it would be just much much less of a carbon budget. Um, so every basically every decision creates an impact on climate and environment. Um, the shorter the distance and less polluting the mean of transport, the lower the CO two footprint of the vacation and uh, um, the people. And we see we we just uh, realized also through the the past years of doing these projects that uh, we can actually yeah make a large contribution with this. Um, approach to um, support people to yeah um, have a higher regard of their local surroundings, be more connected to nature, and then also um, reduce their personal behavior um, outside of vacations um, to where they realize what changed in their surroundings um, through those trips uh, to the NIL parks, um, they might decrease also their personal footprints. Um, this uh, project also included workshops for accommodations and businesses. Um, looking into two further projects, like I said, both in the Black Forest. Um, this is the southern park of the Black Forest, um, there where agroforestry measures are taking place. Uh, very important here for the Black Forest is that uh, regarding climate change, um, it is already one of the warmest regions uh, of uh, of Germany, so a lot of times in summer we have um, 35 degrees Celsius and, and more. Um, but also the wind, um, the strong wind from the west, is taking away um, quite some humidity. 
So it's uh, the agroforestry measures are um, basically the um, the approach to keep and store water um, in the ground in the agricultural soils, uh, counteracting uncertainty the uncertainty of events of precipitation and se severe droughts in the past years. Um, so retaining rainwater in the landscape is the idea through vegetation, soils, and ponds. Uh, you can see a picture on the right where there's like a diverse uh, agricultural landscape. Um, those colleagues work with work closely with the uh, farmers themselves. Um, they have like a rather steep terrain, a lot of times inaccessible. Um, so it's a lot of um, work they have to provide. Um, but also because those um, fields um, are cultivated in a smaller fashion, there's a lot of potential to try out different um, approaches, uh, different um, yeah, parts of those agroforestry measures, um, whether it's um, fruit trees or uh, different kind of hedges, using different kinds of cultivations on the field to see and uh, measure um, what provides the most um, retention level, increasing soil moisture and long-term availability of water rather than uh, intense irrigation in summer months. <clears throat> um, upscaling of this project is planned. Um, and uh, as you can see on the lower right, um, there's uh, just a maybe a quick explanation um, to, to realize, okay, what's the difference in vegetation uh, of how, how much um, water stays in the soil and also um, how um, this soil moisture can keep more of the fertility and um, basically re reduce uh, erosion. And leading over to the next um, case study, um, the northern and central Black Forest NRL Park is also the largest NRL park in Germany. Um, they use uh, regenerative agriculture um, to um, enrich humus and carbon in agricultural soils. Uh, maybe you know this concept from the Terra Preta, which is uh, well known from Central and uh, Southern um, America, for example, in the Amazon. The indigenous people used to uh, work with this approach uh, to raise soil fertility and productivity. Um, also here, this is a, a major issue um, as uh, yeah, 2.6 billion tons of CO2 equivalents uh, are stored in Germany's agricultural soils. Um, it depends, of course, a lot on the humus content that is uh, available in those soils. Um, optimal would be um, a humus content of more than 8%, but um, in more than three quarters of those soils, the humus content is uh, lower than 4%. So there's, of course, quite some potential to also use those agricultural, cultural, um, so basically cultural landscapes to um, store these uh, emissions or reduce those emissions and store carbon uh, in those respective soils. Um, as I said before, um, this is also enhancing water storage and will decrease erosion. Um, their colleagues are working with education, educational workshops with farmers to create a regional network of those farmers so they can also exchange on their experiences and see what works best. Um, um, also here, there's uh, a different locations and approaches, uh, different locations and cultivations used. Uh, for example, also multifunctional agroforestry approaches. Um, and <clears throat> this will, after all, conserve agricultural biodiversity. Um, that's basically all from my side. Um, so feel free to get in touch. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy Thank to Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Actually, I was wondering, um, for the last project in the Black Forest, how do you work with the farmers? Is it on what is the feedback that you get working in this uh, field? Do you get a lot of interest also from their side? Yes, um, especially in this area, there's uh, like in the, in the Black Forest in general, there's a lot of Greenland areas also, um, as many sites are not so, um, so prone to 
to uh, agriculture cultivation. Um, and that's how they realized, okay, this is actually something that we are really good at. We have a lot of experience with. Um, so why not try to use this approach that makes us, this gives us a more fertile soil, also in the cultivated areas. Um, there's a lot of positive feedback. Actually, the, the project is not just taking place in this area, but now they're um, expanding this to more NRL parks in Germany that got interested because uh, the farmers were so happy with the increased productivity, with the um, chance to, to store water and be better off regarding um, the past dry years. So also in other regions, this will actually be take place and be, be implemented. Yeah, very interesting. And that's, yeah, great to hear. Um, yeah, good luck with the projects. And thank, thank you very you. much for sharing. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions to Matthias, please put them in the chat. And with that, we are already reaching our last presentation. And I will hand over to Simone Zanter and Fabian Heinzius from the Naturpark in Ur, Luxembourg, and their way of adapting to climate change. And everybody, can you see everything? Yes. Very good. That's fine. That's great. Thank you. So hello, everyone. And uh, many thanks to the task force and to you, Park, um, for allowing us to present our best practice uh, example today with the National Instru uh, Instrument or Program of the Climate Pact in uh, Luxembourg and it, it, its uh, implementation in our municipalities. Um, we would like um, to start our uh, presentation with a short statement from an article that was published in the scientific journal Nature Sustainability. And although the article is uh, thematically about uh, the drivers of a global sustainable food transition. We think that this uh, statement also applies to climate protection and its dynamics, and that climate protection should also be referred to more frequently as a social norm and become the social norm. So acting climate friendly should be the social norm, and climate protection is only a uh, success if it is supported by all citizens. Um, so please allow me to briefly um, introduce our nature park here in the north of uh, Luxembourg. Uh, we are one of a total of three nature parks in Luxembourg. We were officially founded in 2005 with a duration of uh, 10 years according to the law. So the next extension of the nature park is due in two years, so in uh, 25. Um, the name Nature Park Ur, so the name Ur uh, takes its name from the border river Ur, which has its source uh, in, in Belgium and forms border river uh, to, German, to Germany um, to the east. The objectives and uh, our tasks are defined in, in accordance with the law of 1993 um, uh, on nature parks. And we follow a guiding team that is called Nature and Landscape. And this is uh, mainly the, the basic orientation of our nature park. Uh, we have eight member municipalities and uh, one municipality is candidate for membership and it's the municipalities in, uh, of Weisswampa. On the map, it's the shaded area. Uh, our surface is about 420 square kilometers and we have about um, 24,000 inhabitants living on the area of our nature park. So what are our tasks? Um, we are acting as a regional cooperation platform for sustainable regional development. And we are pursuing an inter-municipal or inter-communal approach uh, based, that is based on solidarity and uh, cooperation. And we strongly maintain an exchange with different uh, local, regional, 
and also national partners like the ministries or government agencies. And of course, we have different roles when it comes to our projects. Uh, sometimes we can be initiator of the project, we can, can be project leader, coordinator, or also advisor or acting like a lobby, like a lobbyist. Um, actually, we have um, uh, 25 employees working, working for our nature parks. And in order to cope with this growth in, in recent um, years and to work in a more structured way, we have organized ourselves into a kind of a department. And one of these departments is our eco unit, which stands for eco, stands for energy, climate, work. And this department was founded in 21 uh, to establish a more um, standardized approach to, to climate protect, protection measures and to offer a regional point of, of contact for all uh, questions about climate protection and for um, our municipalities. Sorry, just. Okay, great. So, um, who is our team? Um, so, we have um, three uh, colleagues who, uh, sorry, four colleagues who are working uh, for the eco unit. That's Daniel Wiedner, our light consultant, Mark Starnes, and Martin Hamm. They're working as project managers for the Climate Pact and uh, Fabian next to me, who joined our team in September this year. And he's also working as a project ma manager and as a light consultant for the Climate Pact. So what are the tasks of um, the four people? So among other things, uh, our team supports all the processes of the Climate Pact. Uh, the team is involved in interregional and national dialogue, of course. Um, furthermore, uh, they act as an interface to other related projects. And um, we are serving as a consulting center and, and we are managing a climate related project in the region, of course. Um, turning to our um, climate protection targets and the associated program or instrument of the climate pack. Uh, the Nature Park UR and its member municipalities have set themselves the goal of implementing the EU climate protection targets and Luxembourg's and the Luxembourg's national targets regionally. Um, however, um, we decided uh, together with our municipalities um, to exceed these targets wherever, wherever possible. And uh, our long-term goal in the region until 2050 is um, the 100% uh, um, greenhouse gas neutrality. And this slide uh, provides you an, an overview of, of the goals that uh, our nature park and its municipalities have set themselves. So one um, main goal would be uh, the uh, municipal climate neutrality by uh, 2015. But also one big target is that our municipalities become um, very important in, in uh, pursuing the goal of, of become or so of having the, the role model effect in our municipalities and of our municipalities representatives um, for other um, municipalities in, in Luxembourg. So it, also in, is, it is also important to, to promote and to raise awareness um, by our municipalities. Yes. So now I will hand over uh, to Fabian, who is the expert of our climate pact and he will give you more detailed information about uh, the instrument 
or the prog or called program of the climate pact. Thank you very much, Simon. So I'm going to explain you what is the Climate Pact. So first of all, the Climate Pact is a program from the Ministry of Environment to support the Luxembourg municipalities in the effort towards sustainable energy production and climate protection. So the, the pact is based on a law, which was uh, defined in 2020, who defines the Climate Pact until 2030. And the second big instrument is the contract between the state and the municipalities um, in which themselves sign that they're going to do good for climate based on the key document, which is the catalog of measures from the European Energy Award. So the Luxembourg Climate Pact is applied through the European Energy Award. But in the Luxembourg Climate Pact itself, we have different classes. So the European Energy Board gives a whole catalog of measures and depending on how many measures a municipality already did or took in their region, they get points. And through these points are four classes of certifications with 75 being the highest, the gold certification, and the state actually invests into the municipalities so they get money per habitants according to their certification level. Now a bit to the EEA program. So the EEA is basically a management tool. Um, there's a four-year cycle behind it. So we have to write, first of all, an activity program. And we're implying this activity program. This will be then monitored and audited by external officers who would now then give us the label or the award to the different class we reached. Um, now we'll go a bit more into detail. So what is inside of this EEA catalog? So it's briefly, it's designed in six categories, which is development and spatial planning. So this is done on the area to develop a climate friendly development plan. Uh, the second category are the municipal buildings and the facilities. Here we find the energy and water management, uh, supply and deposit, which go into waste and resource management, mobility, which obviously are the mobility strategies, the internal organization, now, which is quite important because here we have the budgeting category. So how much money does the municipality actually allow to fight, fight climate change? And the communication and cooperation category which local stakeholders um, and private initiatives. So in total, in this catalog, we have 69 different measures with different weighting, which comes up to 500 points. Now, to give you a bit more concrete example of one measure, I picked the first one, which is the climate and energy strategy and concept. So every municipality has to write or should write a concept and for the Nature Park Ur, we wrote it for our uh, eight or nine member municipalities. So they, we all apply the same spirit, if you want, to fight climate change. And this is the whole north of Luxembourg. In this concept, we'll find the concrete measures and the concrete aim where we want to go, which we can see on the right hand diagram. So we're aiming between 57 and 64 percent of reduction in CO2 emissions until 2050. And now this document explains as well how we want to do that. And you can find it on our website. Unfortunately, it will be only in German. Now, who is participating to the European Energy Award? Initially, it comes from uh, Switzerland and Austria. So in Switzerland and Austria, of course, you will find many municipalities who already reach a certain level within the catalog. Now, coming back to the social norm effect, Luxembourg is the only country where the measures or the, the levels are actually connected to investments from the state. In Switzerland and Austria, for example, there's no money behind it, except for the, the, the hours who are paid for the consultant. 
but still we find most of the communes already have this management process implied in this path because it's expected from the communes to do something good for climate where we want to go as well in Luxembourg. Now, this is an example for our commune Weisswampa, the one of the most north communes. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, Weisswampa, for example, already reached 70% of the total measures you can take within the climate pact, um, being very strong in the internal organization. Now, what are the challenges? As we said, or as Simon said earlier, our aim to 2050 and our current state. Now, how to get from the current state to the aim? We uh, apply a very complex CO2 uh, lowering path. So we have an aim to reduce every year this and this many tons of CO2. This we do through our yearly to-dos. So every year there will be a state of the art checkup. Where are we at? We we'll write it down in an annual report, and this annual report will be presented to our municipal council of the municipals we're, we're helping out. Those then revise the activity program together with us to adapt it for the next year and budget it as well for the next year. Those will be then publicated, so everything we do is public. This can all be found in the municipality websites and also the municipals sign the activity program. So it's sort of legal binding. Thank you very much for your attention. This was a very brief introduction. What I just want to repeat, the European Energy Award has his own website and experts who will be able to explain the catalog much better than me. Um, you will also find the link in the chats or the emails for the European Energy Award. Now, for the context, if you have any more questions for the Climate Pact in Luxembourg, you can, of course, contact me. And if you have any more questions about the Naturpark in general, my colleague Simon will be happy to help you out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone and Fabian. That was a very good insight into uh, your area. And I'm surprised how big this Climate Pact is. That seems like a really big Thing European wide. Um, if there are any questions in the chat, please put them here. We still have a couple of minutes time. If not, we will finish early, which probably everybody's also happy to go to lunch. <laughs> um, yeah, thank, thank you every, for our two our speakers. Um, thank you, Simone, Fabian, Eliot, Matthias. Christian, Nina, um, for joining today, and of course, to all our participants here. Um, yeah, as you have seen, there's a lot of going on already in the NRL parks across Europe, and we hope that this served as an inspiring start to see how others, what others are doing. Um, maybe you could get some ideas or, yeah, just get in touch with the speakers if you want to learn more. Um, and also, once again, we are very proud to have launched the declaration today, and you can find the link in the chat, check it out, and if you're a nature park, get in touch with us and join the movement. We are planning um, quite a few more activities, um, as Nina has mentioned, and the more we are, the stronger is our voice. So, yeah, even if you're not a nature park, check out the declaration, read it, and yeah, get in touch with us. Um, yeah, that's from my side. Um, if there are any other comments from you, as I said, feel free to put it in the chat. We will share the presentations and the recording afterwards, I think in the next couple of days. And probably we will have another webinar next year. So looking forward to that. And thank you very much. Don't forget to fill out our small feedback survey. Um, I think Esther has put the link in the chat as well. We are very happy to receive um, your feedback to improve our webinars. And yeah, with that, I wish everybody a very good day and a happy rest of the week. Thanks for joining.